So today, uh, thanks for being here. We're going to look at uh, Melchizedek, um, who if you've ever looked at Hebrews 7, uh, he shows up quite a bit. And uh, I'm particularly looking at how people in the Middle Ages interpreted Melchizedek and then compare it to some changes uh, in, in the Reformation. Um, so the book of Hebrews obviously has several references, and I've put them up here, uh, to Melchizedek. Uh, he's first introduced in Genesis 14, and then we hear about him later again in Psalm 110. And so these passages will come into play as uh, interpreters uh, explain who Melchizedek is. And I put up here a quote from Hebrews 7. Um, this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, who <coughs> remains a priest forever. And then later it asks, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? And so these are the primary passages that, that interpreters are trying to decide, okay, who is this Melchizedek? What's he all about? Uh, and so the study that I've done uh, is looking at uh, comparing the comments of more than 20 different interpreters from the 4th century to the 16th century. And so I've got some of these up here, the early church, the medieval people, predecessors to the Reformation. Um, so I looked at Chrysostom uh, and Theodoret are both what's considered Antiochian interpreters, uh, early church, 4th century, 5th century, Clemens of Alexandria and Cyril of Alexandria, Augustine and some Aquinas moving later into the Middle Ages, Nicholas of Lyra, Denise the Carthusian, who is, you probably never heard of, uh, he's really compiling a lot of different views, and he, but he's a great person to look at for What's kind of the prevailing view? He's kind of the Cliff Notes version of Middle Eve medieval interpreters. Uh, Jacques Lefebvre de Etat is a humanist uh, and Erasmus as well. And then the Glossa Ordinaria. Um, this one in particular is another uh, important resource to look at. So this is a picture of the Glossa Ordinaria. This area here is the actual scripture text. It's, it's all in Latin. Uh, around it are comments and quotes from people who have commented on this passage. And then in some of them, they also have what are called uh, these small letters here, interlinear glosses. So a gloss, it's kind of like a study Bible, but a gloss is some comment on this passage. So this makes your Bible very huge when you only have a couple of verses <laughs> and a lot of comments all the way around. Most of our reformers, this is the Bible they're reading. This is what Luther is interacting with, uh, that he is reading a Bible like this. And so they're aware of all of these different views and all these different comments. Uh, so those are the, the early people. Then uh, we'll look at a few of the reformers, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, Heinrich Bollinger, Johannes Bugenhagen, who is a Lutheran. Uh, Luther comments on Hebrews before his kind of main Reformation breakthrough. So Bugenhagen is helpful because he's giving a more Lutheran understanding uh, of these texts. And then Johannes Aquilampadius, who is the guy I studied for my dissertation work and continue to do research on, and that picture there, John Calvin. Uh, so I love this picture here of a bunch of uh, reformers centered around the Bible, uh, having the, the candle light up the Bible. So Calvin and Luther are there in the middle. Zwingli is this guy over here. Aquilampadius is the, the guy up here in the, in the right-hand corner. Whoop. Bollinger is the guy in the left-hand corner. And Melanchthon, though we're not going to look at him, is another person that is uh, important in the, in the Reformation era. So what I'm going to do is help set up what's the broad picture of how uh, the exegetical tradition prior to uh, the, the Reformation, how did they interpret Melchizedek? How did they uh, understand it, and what are some of the most prevalent emphases? Obviously, by looking at 20 plus people, I can't tell you everything that every single one of them said. Uh, so this is going to be a broad picture of the most significant things that keep uh, recurring. And what, what we see is, by making this comparison, uh, early Protestant interpreters departed from this medieval exegetical tradition in, some, in a few very significant and specific ways but still remain in significant continuity with the exegetical tradition. Uh, and secondly, that there is not a unified universal agreement, a common understanding 
among the Protestant reformers about Melchizedek, who he is and his location, his purpose. All right, so I want to start with emphases in the exegetical tradition, uh, looking at um, these, these most important aspects. And I have this quote up here from the ancient commentary, Christian, ancient Christian commentary series on Hebrews, uh, from their summary about the early church. There is a diversity of speculation about Melchizedek in the early church, and I'll show us some of that uh, diversity. So exegetes such as Jerome, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, Chrysostom, and Cyril of Alexander all wrote against various beliefs about the identity of Melchizedek. So they're identifying other people hold these views. We are saying that's not uh, the, the right view. This includes that Melchizedek was an angel, that he was some kind of divine being, that he's an eschatological figure that just showed up in Genesis 14, that he's the Holy Spirit, or that he's the pre-incarnate son. Right? These guys are saying that's not who Melchizedek is. Uh, it's very common now, unfortunately, for people to say that Melchizedek is Jesus. Melchizedek is not Jesus. And these, the good interpreters, the careful interpreters, said that was a wrong view. Already back in the early church and in the Middle Ages. And if you know about medieval interpretation, they're looking for Jesus under every rock and in every piece of wood. So it's, it's very notable that they're not identifying this as Jesus. All right? Um, many of them also insisted on rejecting the Jewish rabbinic view that Melchizedek was a precursor to the Levitical priesthood. Um, later medieval interpreters like Aquinas and Lyra note that some of the ancients had drawn these heretical conclusions. They're calling them heresy, that Melchizedek was immortal or some kind of divine being, whether that's the pre-incarnate son or some other uh, kind of immortal being that just showed up there. Uh, while general agreement existed among these interpreters that Melchizedek uh, was a mortal man, his identity was still a major point of debate. And the most prevalent discussion about Melchizedek's identity <coughs> was whether or not he was Noah's son, Shem. Many of the people in this age believe that Melchizedek was Shem. Jerome related that, quote, by calculating the years of his life, Jewish interpreters show that Shem lived up to the time of Isaac. And they say that all the firstborn sons of Noah were priests before Aaron performed the priestly office. So they're saying if we take Genesis 11 and add up all those numbers and we look at when Abraham and Jacob and Isaac are born, Shem is still alive. And if Shem is still alive and the priesthood hasn't been established, the priests are the firstborn ones. And so as the firstborn and he's still alive, then he must be Melchizedek. Uh, so Jerome himself affirmed that Melchizedek was Shem, but he noted many others, like Hippolytus, Irenaeus, Eusebius, and Apollinarius, believed that Melchizedek was not Shem, but rather a Canaanite king. So that's another option that is up there. Epiphanius sought to refute the view that Melchizedek was Shem by providing a different calculation of the time of years from Noah to Abraham. Ephraim the Syrian affirmed not only that Shem and Melchizedek were the same person, but that when Rebekah is finding out that the twins in her womb, that'll be Jacob and Esau, are fighting and are going to be two nations, it's Melchizedek, Shem, who tells her that, because he's the priest and is the one who could have spoken on behalf of Yahweh. Later interpreters uh, remain divided over this issue, though few fail to discuss the possible views. Many of them provide a summary of what the Hebrews handed down about Melchizedek as Shem, particularly through Job, or through Jerome. Uh, Bede, Isidore of Seville, and the Glossa Ordinaria uh, follow the rabbinic tradition and identify Melchizedek is Shem. And Aquinas gives a long discussion about it with no reputation, so apparently he is affirming the view as well. Uh, he observed, quote, according to a gloss, the Jewish interpreters say that Melchizedek was Shem, the firstborn of Noah, and was 390 or 309 years old when Abraham had the victory and he met Abraham, his nephew. Theodoret of Seir, Augustine and Denis, Denis, all uh, explicitly reject this view. So there's some that say this can't be. The reason they give why this is false is that while they still allow for the, poss the possibility Melchizedek could not have been Shem because we're told in Hebrews we don't know his genealogy. 
And so they're saying unless Shem had his name changed later, it doesn't make sense that Melchizedek is Shem. Uh, several others note, well, then he would have been a relative of Abraham. And if he's a relative of Abraham, then that means he's part of the patriarchy, which means it's not about, it, he's, he's part of the Jewish stream, when the whole point about Melchizedek is he's outside of the Jewish-Gentile distinction. And others note uh, that he couldn't have been a foreigner. He had to be a relative of Abraham because he's priest of Most High God and not a priest of idols. So there's a lot of debate about who is this guy uh, and how do we determine uh, his identity. Second matter this, that they often discuss uh, related to his identity is the location of his kingdom. Uh, it says he's from Salem. Many people, like Jerome, uh, would have identified, uh, Jerome identified that many people recognized or said that Salem was what was later called Jerusalem. Jerome himself, though, argued that Salem was the city near Sephopolis where one could still see the ruins of Melchizedek's palace. So he's writing uh, 5th century and saying that those ruins are still there. And so you can go see Melchizedek's palace. Whether or not that's true or not, probably not true. Uh, later people, <laughs> like Augustine and Isidore of Seville, uh, they affirm that Salem was Jerusalem. Uh, Lear and Denis, later in the Middle Ages, so now we're, we've moved ahead seven, eight centuries, uh, identify that the town with the ruins of Melchizedek's palace is in the region of Shechem, which is cited in uh, John 3.23. And so they're saying, you used to be able to see the ruins there, that's where it was. Uh, but that's a different location than what Jerome had said. Um, these three options then persist throughout the Middle Ages. Some will affirm one, some will affirm another. Um, most frequently, it's that Salem is later Jerusalem. Uh, the most important comments, though, by uh, exegetes is how Melchizedek functioned as a type of Christ, uh, particularly based on this, the Hebrew 7 passage. Uh, that they emphasize that Melchizedek resembled the Son of God because he mysteriously bore this type. And by type, we don't mean kind, but that there's a, it, it's a shadow, a foreshadowing. The type comes first, and then what is revealed later is the fullness of that reality. Um, Chrysostom articulated that the apostle, quote, confirms the truth from the type. He instructed his audience to, quote, observe this mystery about Melchizedek, which the Apostle, quote, explained mystically. While there's some use of the term allegory, Christian interpreters of whatever stream, Antiochian, Alexandrian, or neither, explained that Melchizedek represented a type of priest, a type of Christ. This typological approach is repeated throughout the medieval period. Uh, it's in Augustine, Ambrose, Anselm, Aquinas, Lyra, Denise, <coughs> Lux, Ordinary, Lefebvre, and Erasmus. This is pretty common. Uh, they explain how the name and the title of Melchizedek signified he was a type, that he's the prince, or he's the king of peace and the king of uh, righteousness. They reason that the silence of scripture about Melchizedek's lineage and his genealogy uh, meant that the apostle could prove Melchizedek was a type of Christ, who Christ in actuality has no beginning or end. They also articulated how Christ is without father and mother, and have this common refrain here uh, that, is, that shows up in many places. Theodorat, John Cassian, the one that I've cited there is from later in the Middle Ages, from Denis. Christ is, quote, without mother in heaven, according to his divine nature, and without father on earth, according to his human nature. And so they recognize that when it says without father and mother, well, wait a minute, Christ does have a mother, and Christ does have a father, but then this is how they explain, well, here's what the author of Hebrews means by this. And this phrase shows up in many different interpreters in almost the same uh, exact wording. Uh, they often observe the history of Melchizedek from Genesis 14 before they expounded on the typology uh, of Melchizedek. But there's very little explanation about the quotations from Psalm 110 in the, in the medieval tradition. Uh, most exegetes simply identified this psalm as, quote, another authority about the priesthood to show that Christ was made high priest by the Father, or, quote, to prove the priesthood of Christ is from God. 
both Lyra and Denis, for example, assert that the words in Psalm 110 is the Father speaking to the Son. That this is directly applied to Christ. Rather than considering the context of Psalm 110, they immediately moved to Christ. This was God speaking, the Father speaking to the Son. Nearly all interpreters followed Chrysostom in articulating that the central theme in these passages was to show the superiority of Christ's priesthood over the Levitical priesthood as further proof, because this is what they see as the, the theme of the whole book of Hebrews, of the relative superiority of the New Testament over the Old Testament. The majority of comments about Melchizedek center on explaining the numerous differences between Christ's priesthood and the Levitical priesthood. The, the whole discussion about it, he was sworn in with an oath and Abraham giving tithes, all of that, those are the majority of the comments that do not differ very much because they're basically just following the logic of Hebrews 7 and someone explaining, and someone explaining what's there. The most prominent emphases in the medieval exegetical tradition was the view that Melchizedek's ministry carried a type of the Eucharist. Clement of Alexandria uh, was the first to offer the interpretation that Melchizedek gave bread and wine. So I have this picture here. <coughs> this guy is Melchizedek. This is Abraham. And if you can see this, this is bread, and on top of it is a, a jar of wine. Right? In, in Genesis 14, that's what's described there, that he brings bread and wine. Clement said that Melchizedek, quote, gave bread and wine, furnishing consecrated food as a type of the Eucharist. Jerome followed Clement's sacramental explanation by specifying that Melchizedek didn't sacrifice animals, but used bread and wine as a sacrament of Christ's sacrifice. So Jerome is most famously known for being the translator of the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Bible, which everybody used. In Genesis 14, 18, he reinforced this idea by using a verb, uh, offering, we, we would translate English as offering that implies sacrifice. And he uses the conjunction for that implies that the reason that Melchizedek offered this bread and wine was because he was a priest. And so the, the Vulgate implied that Melchizedek made a sacrifice because he was a priest, but the sacrifice he offered was bread and wine. All of the, although this view is absent from Chrysostom, uh, it's affirmed by Cyril of Alexandria, Cyprian, Eusebius, Bede, and Augustine. And Augustine said, this is the main point of the Genesis 14 story. The Melchizedek account was, quote, the sacrament of the Lord's sacrifice prefigured in the priest of Melchizedek. Later medieval exegetes, Anselm, Aquinas, Lyra, Denis, and the Glossa Ordinaria, repeated this view using nearly all the same words to affirm that, quote, Christ did not offer beasts like the priests of the law, but his own body and blood under the appearance of the bread and wine, which was signified by the sacrifice of Melchizedek, who offered bread and wine. Lyra even objected to the quote-unquote perverse explanation that Melchizedek did not sacrifice bread and wine, but merely brought it out to refresh Abraham and his men. So while there's a high degree of agreement on, uh, of disagreement on the identity and the location of his kingdom, there was almost universal agreement on this idea uh, that, that Melchizedek is offering a sacrament of Christ's sacrifice in giving the bread and wine to, to Abraham. All right, so that's the medieval exegetical tradition, broad sweeping terms, three most important, most significant emphases. So what did the formers do with all of this when they read uh, these passages? In the 16th century, many changes are taking place in the church, including how one reads the Bible, how exegetes interpret the Bible. Uh, in conjunction with the, the Renaissance humanist movement, Protestant reformers are approaching the Bible, uh, looking at it somewhat differently, moving away from the medieval, the common medieval approach, uh, the fourfold sense of scripture. They're, they're placing a greater stress on the, the letter, on the historical sense of the Bible. And a basic example uh, is evident from the fact that Erasmus, Bollinger, and Oculampadius are the first to use Hebrew in describing and in explaining Melchizedek. 
Up until that time, it was all Latin or Latin transliterations. They're actually going back to the Hebrew, reading the Hebrew, and explaining Hebrew terms, uh, which, is, which was very rare and almost non-existent other than in Jewish rabbis uh, up until the 16th century. Uh, so, the comments of the early reformers on these passages reveal some important ways that their uh, interpretations both reflect and differ from the exegetical tradition. It can't be maintained that this was a radical departure. There is much more continuity than there is discontinuity, but the discontinuity is significant. Now, a major portion of the comments by the reformers don't differ greatly, particularly when it just summarizes the flow of the text about oaths and tithing and typology. A lot of that is very much the same. Uh, like most in the exegetical tradition, they identify the contrast between the two types of priesthood, one after the order of Melchizedek and the other after the order of Aaron. They echoed much of what the exegetical tradition had affirmed about Melchizedek prefiguring as a type. Some of them used the word shadow, some of them used the word figure, which had to be understood in a spiritual sense. So they don't, they aren't eliminating spiritual senses, but they're recognizing uh, that we need to look at the letter first and then see uh, the spiritual sense. They expressed continuity with the exegetical tradition on affirming the birth, the lineage, and the, the absence of parents uh, mentioned in scripture for the purpose of portraying Christ as a type, or portraying Melchizedek as a type of Christ. Akalampadius, for example, affirmed that, quote, all things converge most excellently in Christ our Lord, which at one time preceded under a type in Melchizedek. Calvin likewise affirmed that Melchizedek was a type of Christ with regard to his name, his title, his lineage, and his genealogy. But none of this typology about Melchizedek is new with the Reformers. We saw all of this already in the Medieval Ages. Uh, it's already been expressed by previous interpreters. The comments that we have from Zwingli, in particular, uh, reflect a high degree of continuity with the exegetical tradition. In fact, his commentary in Hebrews is published after his death. Uh, the editor of his annotations simply stated this, Quote, there's not much needed to say here. Those who wish to know more, go read either Chrysostom or our brother Bollinger in their erudite and pious commentaries published on this epistle. It's all been said before. There's no point in saying it again. So go read theirs. <laughs> Both Zwingli and Bollinger followed the approach of most previous exegetes to show that the apostle used uh, the Melchizedek account to prove the, what's called the comparative excellence of Christ's priesthood over the old priesthood. However, this is where we begin to see some of the differences among the early reformers. Luther, Oculampadius, and Calvin all depart from this view in different ways. Luther, which is common, interpreted everything in light of justification by faith. And so he does the same thing with Melchizedek in the Melchizedekian accounts. Uh, and he also is elucidating the fourfold superiority of Christ's priesthood, not in a comparative way, but in a superlative way. He's saying it's not even worth, it's not even comparable, that this is so vastly different than, uh, than comparing it to the Levitical priesthood. Ocalampadius argued, because he saw this as the theme of Hebrews, that this is another example of why Christ must be heard above all that he is the, the one, the final one through whom we hear um, God's voice, the, the son in these last days who speaks. Calvin looks at the book of Hebrews as an exposition of the two offices of prophet and priest. And so here, the Melchizedek account, he's emphasizing Christ's priesthood, Christ's office uh, as priest. We also see some discontinuity uh, with the exegetical tradition among the earlier reformers with regard to that common refrain uh, about Melchizedek's lack of parents. Luther and Buchenhagen depart by not including anything like it. Uh, both Bollinger and Ockel and Pius include modified versions of the statement, which I have here. Christ is, quote, without father, if you consider his human nature, without mother, if he is divine. And although Calvin didn't repeat a version of it, he did declare, quote, I'm not moved by the objection that the reality does not correspond with the figure and that Christ has a father in heaven and a mother on earth. Uh, so he's aware of and is in conversation with that same discussion. Similarly, 
we see the diversity among the reformers, although this time in continuity with the exegetical tradition, on the various options of the identity of Melchizedek. So they're like the Middle Ages in the <coughs> having the same debate. Luther affirmed that the chronology of Genesis made it certain Melchizedek was Shem. So Luther agrees with that. Oculampanius, however, refuted, referred to that view as, quote, plainly Jewish temerity, foolishness, reasoning that what Scripture <coughs> ignores, we may also ignore. Scripture's not talking about it, so let's, let's not even bother with talking about it. He instead reiterated that, quote, it is certain that Melchizedek did not appear, suddenly sprung up from the earth without parents and immortal, but rather Scripture simply did not mention these things. Bollinger, likewise, rejected that Melchizedek was Shem. However, he affirmed the view that Melchizedek was a Canaanite king, who also had a role as priest. Calvin, on the other hand, insisted that Melchizedek was a godly, unknown foreigner, we don't know who he is, who is, quote, surrounded by the unholy people of the Canaanites on the one side and the unholy people of Sodom and Gomorrah on the other side. Uh, he argued that the apostle intended more than just the idea that the family of Melchizedek was obscure or unknown, uh, but he also rejected the notion that, quote, the very man who met Abraham is still alive, as some stupid people have naively thought. <laughs> Calvin does that a lot. <laughs> he, repeated, he repeatedly noted that the apostle doesn't speak about Melchizedek in terms of, let's focus on him as an individual, but Melchizedek as a type of Christ. And he's, again, similar to following what Aquilum Padius does, saying, let's focus on what the text focuses on. Now, one of the most notable ways that the reformers uh, diverged from the exegetical tradition was by incorporating more detail about historical matters. This is evident from comments about the location of Melchizedek's kingdom. Oculampadius affirmed the view that Salem was Jerusalem by quoting from the historian, the Jewish historian Josephus. In fact, he quotes many times from Josephus in explaining the historical background uh, of these passages. Uh, he quotes extensively from him on multiple occasions to provide uh, support for his views. Bollinger also appeals to Josephus and his interpretations. However, he affirms the view that Salem was not Jerusalem, but rather as Jerome taught, that city near Scythopolis that's mentioned in Genesis 33. Um, Calvin likewise provides more substantial background on the biblical and historical details than previous exegetes, and he agrees with Oculampadius' view that Salem was Jerusalem. It should also be noted that uh, Oculampadius is not satisfied with just saying Salem is Jerusalem, but includes a mystery within the history. And that's a phrase that he uses often. Uh, he declared that Christ, quote, is truly king of Jerusalem, first called Salem, that is, of all the church and of the elect. So his identification of Salem is not just the city of Jerusalem, but as a designation for the church. And this is very rare among any previous interpreters, with only Bede even mentioning this as a, fo and a form of this idea. So Auckland Pontius identified this spiritual sense by making a thematic link across multiple passages which explicitly connect Jerusalem with the church. And so he's saying that Melchizedek as priest of Jerusalem and Christ as priest over the church. Auckland Pontius specified in several places that in order to understand rightly the mystery of Melchizedek, everything that could not be explained only according to, quote, the letter from the history of Melchizedek. So he's one who very much emphasizes the historical, <coughs> but also includes a spiritual sense. Another unique way that Aquilampadius and later Calvin departed from the exegetical tradition and the other reformers was in their attention to the use of Psalm 110. Like most in the exegetical tradition, both Bollinger and Zwingli only provide brief comments about the historical background of Genesis 14 and the quotation from Psalm 110. Instead, they focus on how this directly applied to Christ, just as we saw in the medieval tradition. Aquilampadius, on the other hand, spent significant space considering Old Testament passages in their original context. He related and rejected three different interpretations about Melchizedek. He dismissed the view that Melchizedek was, quote, not a proper name, but they say is some kind of fantasy, with a name merely emphasizing the righteousness and peace of his offering. He also explained the flaws with the views that the one addressed as Lord 
In Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, was either Abraham at the time of his victory in Genesis 14, or David because he established his, uh, his kingdom in Jerusalem, which is, quote, to the right of the temple and thus at the right hand of God. So these are Jewish explanations for Psalm 110 that Aquilampadius is, is rejecting. He instead recognized that the apostle specifically uses Psalm 110 because the psalmist already understood that the, the na this nature of the mystery of Melchizedek from Genesis 14. So he's seeing a movement already evident in the Old Testament. That Psalm 110, the psalmist is seeing there's something here in Genesis 14 that's going to come about later. And it's going to be revealed more later. And so Aquilampadius says, those things were not chiefly written on account of Melchizedek, but on account of him whose type he carried, Christ. Calvin follows Aquilampadius by also insisting that Psalm 110 must be understood properly in its Old Testament context. His explanations are similar to those of Aquilampadius, though Calvin also addressed other interpretations from Christian and Jewish interpreters that previous exegetes had not mentioned as well. Uh, the most obvious areas of departure in the exegetical tradition by the Reformers has to do with the contemporary priesthood of their time in the Roman Church. They vehemently disliked it. Uh, while this is less pronounced in Zwingli uh, and Calvin, Aquilampadius incorporates it in several places. Bollinger goes at it, though. Uh, he engages in this most frequently. Bollinger strongly and repeatedly emphasized that the Melchizedekian priesthood proved that the contemporary Roman Catholic priests were not legitimate and were constituted without merit, but were constituted, quote, perhaps according to the order of Baal, Ahab, and Jezebel. <laughs> And that's one of the tamer ways. <laughs> Related to this divergence is the consistent departure from the Antocene tradition and rejecting the notion that Melchizedek's offering to Abraham was a type of the Eucharist. Zwingli's commentary doesn't include the discussion, but in, other, in another polemical treatise, Zwingli, quote, vigorously attacks the Roman Catholic contention that Melchizedek resembles Christ chiefly in that he sacrificed bread and wine. And while Bollinger didn't say anything about the typology of Melchizedek offering bread and wine, based on his other comments about the negativity, his negativity toward the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the fact that he changes this verb from offering to giving indicates uh, that he also is rejecting uh, this view. But all the reformers rejected this view. Luther explicitly rejected it. Uh, stating that, that the order of Melchizedek, quote, signified that Christ offered bread and wine. Aquilampadius also explicitly declared that Melchizedek was a priest, quote, not from the offering of bread and wine, but from righteousness, peace, and the duty of love. He further specified that when Melchizedek, quote, provided food for the army of Abram, for the term bread comes from a Hebrew trope for all kinds of edible things by which men fed, he blesses the Lord who had given his enemies into the hands of Abram. So notably, Aquilampadius again offered a spiritual interpretation that he says, if you want to find an allegory, it's not the Eucharist, if you want to find an allegory, it's that Christ, the living bread, feeds and strengthens his people as victor of this world. Calvin also included a lengthy refutation of the ideas that Melchizedek's offering of bread and wine was a type of the Eucharist. And that this showed that, quote, the ancient doctor, he was surprised, uh, or this showed that, quote, the sacrifices of bread and wine are the symbols of the priesthood of Christ. He expressed surprise that so many doctors of the church were so taken up with this trend. How could they be such good interpreters and fall for this? Uh, Calvin also suggested the same thing as Aquilampadius, the importance is Melchizedek's blessing of the priesthood. And noted that this was the role for the contemporary minister, the Protestant minister. Calvin also suggested the same alternative interpretation as Aquilampadius, though he re avoided referring to it as allegory, uh, in that, uh, quote, if there is any mystery about the offering, it is only fulfilled in Christ inasmuch as he feeds us when we are hungry and tired out with weariness. Though again, there's not complete agreement among the reformers, this is a significant departure uh, from the exegetical tradition. And so, to quote there, Christ, 
the, the allegory is there is Christ feeds us when we are hungry. So, pull this all together. There's general agreement with the tradition uh, in offering especially explanations about Melchizedek as a type. There's a shift toward a greater emphasis on the literal letter in the historical sense, yet not complete elimination of the spiritual sense. Uh, and they overturn the almost universal view on Melchizedek's offering as a type of the Eucharist. Uh, and there's a continuity with this continuing variety uh, of interpretations on Melchizedek. So these are the most important, most significant, and what the reformers did with it uh, in explaining Melchizedek.